Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 482. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast, a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. For more information or to check out other shows on this wonderful network, please visit evergreenpodcast.com. So this week's interview is with Jay Godfrey. Jay is a multi-time entrepreneur and co-founder of New Sharma that provides medically supervised psychedelic treatments for sustained relief from depression, anxiety, chronic pain, PTSD, and addiction. Previously, Jay built an eponymous fashion brand that had success around the world and was worn by tremendous celebrities such as Jennifer Lopez, Viola Davis, and Laverne Cox. In this discussion with Jay, we look at his career trajectory and pivot into Nushama. We explore the evolution of psychedelics and the pathologies it can help. We look at the business case and peek into the future of this exciting new field. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com. And please, if you have a moment, do consider to go drop in your rating and review. And don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. Jay Godfrey. Well, what a name and what a person. I um, was introduced to you by our mutual friend, Marissa Feinberg. Thank you, Marissa. You, are, you have quite a story. And um, to be transparent for everybody, this is going to be a story about drugs. Um, we'll get into it. And it's going to be a good story. It's the first time I would say, Jay, that I've had somebody where we're basically going to be focusing on that. I've had lots of conversations with people who, like Jamie Wheel, and others, we talk about psychedelics, but this one, this is going to be the topic. Although, what I'd like to do, start with Jay, is, is have you describe who is Jay Godfrey? Well, if you would ask me that question many, many years ago, I would have <clears throat> probably said something along the lines as, uh, of, you know, I am a investment banker, which I was, or I am a fashion designer which I also was at one part of my life, or I am a husband, or I am a father. Uh, but that's, that's, those are functions, those are identities that uh, with the use of uh, entheogenic and empathogenic and psychedelic medicines, um, the definition of identity has certain cha certainly changed for me. Um, I'm a Canadian. I grew up in Toronto, Canada, uh, really with a lovely family and, and, you know, without problem, or at least I thought, you know, there's no uh, focal point in my life where I witnessed the death or got abused or, you know, had any sort of major trauma. I kind of had a storybook childhood. And my father always encouraged me to get a degree in, in law or finance, as every good Northeastern Jewish parent does. And um, I did and moved to New York at kind of 21 years old, became an investment banker and basically said, oh, shit, this is torture. And uh, I loved fashion at the time and thought, well, why not do what every <laughs> fashion, every investment banker does when they've reached the end of the rope, which is apply to design school. And uh, I went to the Parsons School of Design and, and, and subsequent to that. Uh, developed a women's fashion brand uh, named after me and I had a very kind of successful career in fashion uh, for about 15 years and around the 12 year mark I recognized that while I reached a certain level of success uh, something wasn't right and I started to go to therapy talk therapy and I'd sit there and tell my story to my therapist week in, week out, three years, every single week, $350 a week. So tens of thousands of dollars on therapy and then recognized that I really was not getting to the heart of the matter. I should preface what I'm about to say is I've really done almost no drugs in my life, uh, which is might be 
confusing to some listeners of why this is a podcast about drugs and I've barely done any. Uh, I think I smoked pot in college four times or something like that. <laughs> yeah, wild man. And, uh, you know, my, my Friday and Saturday nights would be crazy. I might have a glass and a half or two glasses of wine. So, but after a couple of years of therapy, I recognized that something wasn't right. And then I was, the short story is I was introduced to plant medicine. And uh, that is why I'm here today, I would imagine. Um, and I founded a company about a year ago called New Shama Wellness. And it is to, our goal is to humanize medicine through psychedelics. And we have clinics in New York City, which at the moment administer ketamine uh, in combination with talk therapy and an exquisite environment. Um, which I've seen. And yeah, we, it was lovely having you, you here a couple of weeks ago. And as psychedelics become more destigmatized and legalized, um, we are going to be the, or we feel like we're going to be the go-to brand for people looking for not just a medicalized experience, but a spiritual and psycho-spiritual experience. All right. So let's circle back a little bit. And, and um, whether it was you at the investment bank or you as the fashion designer, CEO thereof, what would the, the Jay Godfrey of today say to the Jay of that day? Would there be some material differences to the way he should have gone about his life? Or is that part of the journey that he needed to do to get to where he is today? I think it was part of the journey that needed to happen. But if I had the benefit of 42-year-old Jay now versus, let's call it, 24-year-old Jay, the first thing I would say is try less. Stop squeezing the tennis racket so tight or the golf club so tight. And slow the fuck down. Because mm -hmm. it really, um, you know, we have a societal uh, bill of goods that are being sold to us which is do, 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 do. And it really robs us and takes us away from our truest, highest self. And that's what I loved about, you know, psychedelic therapy is it really brings you back to that. So it seems to me, Jay, that if we, we, we look back, part of the problem is society, but also a lot of it's education, the way we are trained stuff our brain with stuff to get a competency, a skill. And like you say, with all good old fashioned Jewish fellows, become a professional, a doctor, become a, a lawyer uh, and make, make a good living, make yourself proud. But that that's the rat race. And, and we, we, we need to deprogram. Cause if, if you say to yourself, Jay, Hey, 24 year old, slow down. It's, it's in contrast to everything else we're being shot at. And it's hard to, to sift through and, and, and embrace that thought. It is. And, you know, if I would have heard, you know, Ryan Holiday, for example, talks about stillness is the key. Um, if I would have heard the notion or narrative that in order to accomplish more, you need to do less, I would have said that's a crock. But what seems to happen is we, or at least I was living in a very distracted world. You know, Johan Hari talks about it in his latest book, Stolen Focus, where we're in a constant state of distraction and multitasking, which takes us away from doing anything well. So once I understood that in order to do more, I needed to do less and, and be, um, life became very, very different. The other thing that is interesting along those lines is, you know, you always hear people talk about meditation uh, in positive light. And then you hear just as many, if not more, talk about it in negative light as if you're wasting your time sitting there. And why would I sit silently when I can do something productive? And what I've recognized in, whether it's meditation or you know, guided psychedelic journeys, the stillness that is created is building up a certain adaptive 
uh, energy. And whether that different plane of consciousness is um, altered or whether it's just done with your breath, it really creates space. And that space allows you to pause between stimulus and response. And so that little pause allows more creativity. It allows uh, uh, less reactivity and creates a better life, but also allows one to accomplish more. So it is antithetical to this idea of go, go, go. But if you're in stillness for two hours and you work for eight, versus going, 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 going for 10, you will accomplish more in the eight by having two hours of stillness. Yeah, so there's nuance in this because it's not about just doing nothing. It's, it's still, you're still doing a ton of stuff. You've got shit to do and, and things you don't like to do. You just have to do that. But when you have that stillness that allows you to pause before you get jumpy, uh, where stress, team, where your sort of cortisol hormones tend to take over, you'll jump in and, and chew out somebody where you didn't mean to do that, or you, you, it's not what you really feel about them. Well, indeed. And, and I'm glad you mentioned stress and cortisol because, you know, there's a lot of talk in wellness circles about longevity, but then there's also, you know, this idea of how I can do more and multitask and fit more into the day and uh, efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. That's right. And what, we know, although mainstream medicine doesn't really want to talk about this, is a very, very basic concept. We know that stress increases cortisol. And we know cortisol creates inflammation. We also know that inflammation causes every disease out there. For some reason, we're unwilling to accept that the step one in that, which is stress, and the final step is disease and or death are connected. That's for sure how I ended up a type one diabetic. Is, uh, it hasn't yet killed me, but, <laughs> but um, stress was the reason I got it. That's, there's no doubt in my mind. By, by living in a, in a toxic corporate culture that I was trying to compete with or fight against and at one point something had to go and we we tend not to want to read those signs we're like oh well, i'm superpower i can get over that i'm young i can do that and these are types of messages which are hard to undo when you're going back to the younger self or speaking to younger audiences about oh just you know spend two hours doing nothing when everybody around you is doing 10 hours and you sit there in a yoda position it very, you know, the FOMO concept on the one hand, and then to Johan Hari's point, this, I think we've been too programmed for, especially in the learned areas, curiosity. And, and curiosity is a beautiful thing. But if you don't have, if you have unbounded curiosity, you can spend your day just getting warped into wormholes and rabbit holes and and you never end up doing anything. So I think that we've we've become. Well, I think we're diagnosed ADD or difficulty with attention, but more because of what we're surrounded by, and 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 because of our lack of education to deal with this, rather than having necessarily a physiological disorder. We like to and, and big pharma and big medicine. They like to separate uh, physiological. <laughs> from psycho-spiritual or psychological. Um, we, and those rabbit holes that you talk about, whether it be YouTube, where they're automatically playing the next video that the algorithm suggests, you know, you watch, or whether it's TikTok or Instagram, they're really robbing us of our focus. And so all this busyness isn't busy at all. It's just one distraction after the next. And so the way I would, if I had to sell this idea of stillness or sell an idea of slowing down, 
you know, you, you'd almost have to add a profit motive to it for people in the westernized, you know, rat race to really understand. But I'm sure if you put uh, uh, stillness into the days of a Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs investment banker, I could almost assure you that if they had the discipline to continue in whatever mindfulness or stillness um, uh, program that they were doing, I could almost assure you that their creativity would be increased, their output would actually be increased with less input. Uh, and for them, what would make them very, very happy, and there's nothing wrong with this, they'd make a lot more money. Well, and, and it might even be more pleasant people. Um, I mean, I don't want to slam all investment bankers. They don't, they certainly don't come with the best reputation and the, the office culture and the way they are at home with their spouses, children, the cashier, the bus driver, if they deign to take a bus. Um, you know, that, that whole attitude is, is uh, somewhat narcissistic. Uh, anyway, all around power and ego in the most part. And, and that's part of the problem. I want to just come back, Jay. I mean, we've got a bunch of things to talk about, but just before we go on, uh, your experience as a CEO of your fashion brand, because really that's quite cool. There aren't so many of you guys, investment bankers, I am one as well, who converted into fashion. You, you might at the age of 55, you know, be a charitable donation to one. You might be on the board of one, but to start one, I mean, that's, that takes a whole bunch of, uh, of ideas and creative creativity. That's not the number one talent I would give for investment bankers, unless you're talking about financial rules. Yeah. So when you got into, into this, how obvious was it for you to have it under your own name brand, to choose women's fashion? What was the powering motivation behind all of that? The powering motivation behind getting into the fashion industry was probably different than different then than when I look back at it now. Mm. Uh, but at the time, I really believed deep in my heart that I needed to express my creativity. I loved, uh, obviously, still do uh, love women and the expression of how they they can. Uh, express their truest version of themselves through fashion. So I really, really loved that. Um, and it was a, really a gift of a lifetime to have a brand with my name on it. Um, but it taught me so much. And it taught me a lot about ego, which I probably still have some of, but much less than I did before. It taught me about building walls in the form of ego around you. It taught me about uh, the search for validation. Uh, and it taught me about competitiveness, which is uh, a pretty unhealthy and destructive um, way of living. So I love that industry. I still love fashion. I just uh, recognize now as 42-year-old Jay that some of the motivations of why I went into it went back to experiences when I was a teen uh, and, and even slightly younger than that, where I was a little bit socially awkward. I was an overweight kid. I didn't get the attention that I wanted from women. And it was almost a way of showing everybody that I could become you know, a popular and followed and revered designer in women's wear, despite the fact that I couldn't get their attention when I was 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Or because you couldn't. Exactly. Exactly. So um, obviously I was completely asleep to that idea when I went into the industry at, at 24 years old. And I have no regrets. I would probably, you know, life has been a beautiful, beautiful journey for me. And it continues to unfold with all these different uh, uh, ways of expressing myself, whether it be originally as an investment banker, then as a fashion designer, and now as a entrepreneur in the, in the wellness space. I'm Anne-Marie Kelly. 
Wild Precious Life is a podcast about dreaming big, digging in and connecting across distance, division, and loss. In each episode, I talk with prize-winning writers, musicians, and wanderers who remind all of us how we can make the most of the time we have. So meet me here. Let's walk and talk and dream and discover what it means to be wild, precious, and brave. I, you know, I wonder, Jay, I, I'm connecting the dot between this, what you've just talked about, and another interview I had recently published uh, with Penny Power, who was talking about how she created a, a social network and a community. And in the end of the day, it seemed to be a, a, a commercial enterprise that was really fulfilling a personal need. And, and somehow, especially for the entrepreneurs, I, I, I systematically hear that link between who I who I deeply am and what I really deeply need and the product I go and and sell. And it looked very it's it's very far away at some level, you know, making a dress and and your twelve year old issues. But there's that. And I just wonder how if most entrepreneurs could tap back into that as opposed to the well, I got to make a buck, and it's all about you know, doing well and getting the big house and all that and how much angst and badness that comes out of that. You, you, I mean, you, you were obviously really successful getting to have, you know, Jennifer Lopez and other uh, big names carry a brand. I was just wondering to what extent you look back and you say, I named it Jay Godfrey. What's your narrative around that? The narrative that I see now was, I needed the validation. I wanted to be a star. You know, I looked up to Tom Ford and Halston and said to myself, they're a star. Look how popular they are. Um, I want that. I need that. And it was very ego driven, the search for validation, both from a uh, name perspective and a financial perspective. Um, You know, I, I grew up in a home of, of overachievers, father, as 83 years old to this day and, and works and is super successful. And I have two brothers who are, are extremely accomplished as well. And being a youngest child in that home, which was a very loving home and remains a loving home. Um, you know, I felt the need to prove myself. And me, and me, me, <laughs> you know, where do I don't exist. Well, that's right. You know, and I need, you know, I felt like I needed the profile. So I slapped my name on the door and on every label. And, um, you know, maybe there was actually something subversive about the idea of having the label inside of a woman's dress when I couldn't get inside the woman's dress when I was younger. So I don't know. Um, But it was very much in retrospect, uh, fulfilling what I thought was a need to be successful, to be famous, to be have profile, to be loved and adored, uh, to be you know, to seek celebrity. And I recognize not with regret, but with awareness that uh, that was me trying as of when I went back to earlier in this discussion, what I would say to my 24 year old self would be try less. That was me trying so hard to get that. And no matter how successful or how much profile I got or whether I dressed Jennifer Lopez or any other celebrity, it didn't matter because underneath, even just, you know, right beneath beneath this, the layer of, of surface, I wasn't deeply happy. And that really led me to what I think is my life's work. And which was uh, a journey towards journey within to finding my truest self. And that, by the way, is where Penny, my former interviewee, landed as well. So let's now talk about New Shama. So um, you, your, your, your pathway into that was through herbal medicine. And then you discover that there are all types of herbs including ketamine and, and others. The decision to, to launch this business, how did that come around with your co-founder? 
a great question. So after three years of therapy, and I was introduced to uh, plant medicine, and I had no real uh, desire to dive deep into the world of entheogenic or psychedelic medicines. I thought what most people thought, they're dangerous and they're addictive. And why would I want to do something that's both dangerous and addictive and that the you know, the DEA in here in the United States um, has a schedule one, you know, drugs and that are in the same class as cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine and, and the like. And so how could this possibly be good? And I read How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan, which really, uh, I think, came out in 2018. And it really kind of changed people's views, because here was this guy who wrote about nutrition and wellness and and, and, and eating a plant-based diet. And he basically turned the narrative on its head, which was, first, these are not dangerous. Secondly, they are not addictive. And third, they've been used in many cultures around the globe, especially in the Amazon, but also in Africa and many indigenous cultures in North America, to heal or to treat ailments of the spirit. And when I look back at where I was sitting in 2019, I was despirited. I had everything in life I wanted. A beautiful wife and da uh, two daughters, an amazing supportive family back home in Canada, a business where that gave me fame and all, and, and all the trimmings that came along with that, an incredible lifestyle of travel and stuff that comes with that too. And I was not happy. And so at that point, after reading Michael Pollan's book and then following up with probably another dozen or so before my first psychedelic experience, including James Fadiman's The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide, I really thought, well, you know, we've been sold a bill of goods and we've been sold a falsehood that these are dangerous and they're addictive. And after my first journey with plant medicine, it was a, about a six hour experience with psilocybin. My whole world was shattered and my belief systems were shattered in the best possible way. Nothing was the same again. And I couldn't unsee what I saw in that experience. And I couldn't unfeel what I felt in that experience. And, and to kind of give you a little snapshot, I had never experienced true unfettered beauty, love, stillness, acceptance, compassion in one sitting, all at once. And I knew as I came out of that experience in August 2019, that life was never going to be the same. I started doing these guided treatments almost monthly. And as COVID really started to rage, people were not wearing women's cocktail dresses to go to parties and weddings and bar mitzvahs and whatever. And in May 2020, I had a whole journey and experience where I felt like I was chosen to do this work. And... I started to have a brand new appreciation for what is God. And I recognized that that westernized man with the long white beard in the sky, who was, you know, would punish you if you didn't obey, uh, wasn't the new definition of what I had discovered God was. And it wasn't a religious concept. It was a, it was a concept that existed in me. And I felt like in these experiences that I was in co-creation with the universe and that I could do almost anything so long as my brain didn't stop me or convince me otherwise. So in May, 2020, I had a whole journey that not only was I chosen to do this work, 
but I was also that it was incumbent upon me. It was my duty to bring this work into a medicalized, above ground, acceptable treatment to New York and more broadly to America, but done so in a way that does not treat somebody who's suffering with depression or PTSD or alcohol use disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder or any mood disorder as if something is wrong with them, but to treat them as if something, as someone who's just been dispirited because of something, we're going to call it trauma or wounds, that has happened to them. And I recognized fairly quickly that there is not one single human being out there that has not experienced something in the realm of trauma, capital T trauma being death in the family, divorce, abuse of some sort, or you know, lowercase t trauma, which is somebody told you you were stupid or too tall or too short or too fat or too skinny or just not good enough. And you take that into adulthood. And when you take that not good enough into adulthood, it manifests itself, starting with anxiety or depression or PTSD, but then actually further manifests itself, as we discussed earlier, into inflammation and disease. And so I recognized that by treating the spirit, you could treat the whole body. And that was the genesis of why Richard Meloff, my dear friend of 25 years, started New Shama. He came from a completely different background as, as an attorney who had worked in the, the legal cannabis business in Canada. And he was seeing something that was pretty troubling to him, which was uh, veterans were coming back from Afghanistan with PTSD. And the government was allowing them to have 10 grams a day or up to 10 grams a day of marijuana or cannabis treat their symptoms. And he thought that that was just the zombification of these people. And he saw, after hearing about my experiences with psychedelics and how they got really to the root of the problem, the root of the trauma, that he thought that there was a better way. And so we joined together with an anesthesiologist by the name of Dr. Elena Ocher, who had been working with ketamine as a anesthetic, as a analgesic for pain relief, and as a psychedelic for mood disorders for, for around 30 years to create Nishama. And we believe that we are operating at the intersection of not only psychedelics, but hospitality uh, and medicine as well. And so we believe the psychedelic experience isn't just me a medicalized experience, but a psycho-spiritual one where people need to feel held and to feel like they're in an environment that is truly hospitable as if you're going to a luxury hotel. Much in there, Ajay. Um, I wanted to cite uh, the film done by the Banazos who I've had on my show, uh, the film called The Wisdom of Trauma that features Dr. Gabor and Mate and, and uh, how we all have trauma. And, and so that reinforces that message. Then this feeling of um, spirituality, the, the feeling I get, and maybe we're going to get into that next, which is that the need for what you're doing is forced on us by what Hari has talked about, this sort of overwhelmingness of life and the hurry, 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 do, do, do of society. And also because we're losing touch with religion. And religion may be not playing the role it could be for other reasons. And society anyway, it seems outside of two religions, it seems to be running away from religion in general. You've been saying just before we got online how business is good because so many people are coming. Why do you think that is? Well, I think pre-COVID, people were really struggling. 
And I think post COVID, they're struggling a hell of a lot more. You know, Hari talks about this idea of lost connections. And if depression was simply a serotonin chemical imbalance in the brain, well, Big Pharma could come up with a SSRI or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which sole purpose would be to rebalance the serotonin in your brain. So in 1987, Prozac came out. And here we are, I don't know, 35 years later, and depression is raging. 40% of Americans identify as either, either having anxiety or depression. So that begs the question, if these SSRIs like Prozac work at rebalancing this problem of chemical imbalance, why don't they work? And, you know, the thesis is, is that we have become disconnected. We've become disconnected from um, meaningful values. We've been disconnected from nature. We've been disconnected from our trauma, uh, as Gabor Mate talks about and unaware of it. We've been disconnected from communities. We've been disconnected from, um, you know, meaningful work. And two years at home for many people, especially in the UK and Canada, and to a degree in the United States, turned those lost connections and ramped them up to a point where people are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And hence, when we opened Nushama's flagship at Madison Avenue and 53rd Street, and it's a large center, there's almost 7,500 square feet with 18 treatment rooms. We built it for the future because we recognized that mood disorders like depression and PTSD and anxiety needed to be treated and the current solutions weren't working. But what we didn't foresee was that our opening would be a doorway for so many so quickly. And it's a, a little bit of an, a sad narrative that so many need help, but I'm grateful that Nushama is here to facilitate and I, I say the word facilitate because we are not, uh, this is not a panacea. This is not a magic or silver bullet. But we provide safe psychedelic journeys for the purpose of facilitating change, of opening that doorway, opening the doors of, conscious, uh, doors of perception, as Aldous Huxley wrote about, so that people can go in or go inward. And without the regos, without the justification and domination and search for validation and righteousness and opinions, free of that, they can look inside and see what has happened to them. And invariably, when people do this work with intention, under the right circumstances, the right setting, and going in with the right mindset and the right dose, they recognize not only what has happened to them, but oftentimes they forgive those that have done it to them. And more importantly, forgiving themselves for, for allowing themselves to be living in victimhood and living in blame. And so it allows them to transcend that negative worldview and start taking responsibility because they oftentimes have found the God within them. That is not a religious concept. It is a concept that simply is a basic recognition that creation isn't a concept outside of you. And it's beautiful to see it when people recognize that. And, and uh, religiosity can still work in that space. I was interviewed a chap called John Perkis, who has converted himself, has, has renamed himself as Banahasta and become a complete Hinduist. Um, and, and he says, well, I am total consciousness and so are you. 
having this enlightenment within. I feel like I want to get to the business side, but let's talk first about an experience. So, oh, this is really interesting. I'm going to roll up to 53rd in Madison. I want to go to New Shama. Um, never done any of these scary drugs before. Uh, Mr. Godfrey, what am I going to do? So safety is our number one priority here. And I think that's the biggest stigma associated with psychedelics is they're somehow dangerous. So we do a medical intake and a psychiatric intake on every single person who comes to New Shama. We want to know their history. Do they see a therapist? Are they on medications? Do they have a family history of mental illness? And we use those sessions to prepare them for the psychedelic experience, which can be euphoric and loving and beautiful and can be challenging at times to see, to look within and to tell yourself the truth. But once somebody is cleared to go on their treatments and our protocol is, is all evidence-based medicine, um, there's a, a, a plethora of research supporting a six ketamine infusion uh, protocol where uh, these treatments are done over the course of three or four weeks. And somebody would come into our center, they, they would have to have fasted for about four or five hours, no alcohol, drugs, uh, or, or sex, actually, the night before. And they would come into our center, be guided directly into a private room. In that room, there is uh, a beautiful zero gravity chair, uh, a set of noise canceling headphones, an eye mask, and even a Nishama teddy bear to hold if they wish. And then a nurse places an IV in their arm, which is only a little bit of a prick for one second. And a integrationist or a therapist comes in the room and has about a five or 10 minute discussion to determine what the person who's about to embark on this psychedelic journey wishes to accomplish. Some people say, I just wish to let go and see, you know, see whatever I see and surrender to the experience. And that is a perfectly legitimate intention to go in with, especially for the first time. Others who are further along in the treatment protocol might get more granular. They might want to discuss, well, I want to understand why is it that every time I'm with family or I'm at work, I get triggered. And after the intention is set, the integration therapist or facilitator guides them through a small window, a couple minutes of breath work to relax the body. And then the ketamine is administered through the IV. Unlike other psychedelics that are taken orally, like MDMA or psilocybin, the onset of peak experience is in about 90 seconds or two minutes. So you are you are taken gently over the course of two minutes or 120 small steps into a peak psychedelic experience. And you are at that peak for approximately one hour. After the hour uh, and the drip, ketamine drip ends, it takes somewhere between five and 15 minutes for you to come back to this plane of consciousness. During the experience, you are wearing these noise canceling headphones with a guided playlist that really is intended first to guide you into the experience with spoken word and inspiration. Through the bulk of the peak experience, you are listening to instrumentals. And then as you are slowly coming out, there are vocals that are really intended to ignite the spirit within you. Afterwards, the integration therapist comes back in and there's a discussion. And that discussion is called integration, which we believe is the most important part of the psychedelic experience. In fact, internally, we talk about this idea that it's 10% the type of psychedelic you take, whether that be ketamine being the only, the, the only legal one or any of the ones that are currently being studied like psilocybin, MDMA, DMT, ibogaine, 
LSD. Uh, LSD. 10% is molecule, 10% is your diagnosis, and 80% is your preparation and integration. So in the integration, the idea is to glean a key insight. What did you learn about yourself during that one hour experience? And for those who've never had a psychedelic experience, you have no idea whether you've been there for 10 minutes or 10 hours. Space and time is completely eliminated. And there is a total uh, dissolution of ego and separation of body from self. And people say, well, that sounds so scary. It more often than not is a very loving, relaxing experience. Once you glean your key insight, and you're back to the, this level of consciousness, it's time to go home. And that's where the work really starts, is are you going to integrate what you've learned about your experience, about yourself, into your daily life? And that's where the best outcomes come. And so that is a typical archetypal uh, experience within the Nushama Clinic. But we also, believe and on the heels of what Johan Hari said in Lost Connections, that we are disconnected from meaningful interactions with each other or community, that we believe that there are many other ways to extend the efficacy of this work through non-hallucinogenic experiences like breath work, like meditation. And that is why once a week we host community events. So people who are members or patients of Nushama can come meet other like-minded individuals and participate in a ceremony of sorts, whether it be meditation, holotropic breath work, cacao ceremony, some non-medicinal uh, way of getting back into that consciousness. And the outcomes are astounding. I come home every day from I guess you could call it work, but it does, certainly doesn't feel like that. With stories of rebirth and redemption and transcendence of people who've decided right then and there that they're going to let go of what's been holding them back. And it's beautiful. In so many of these experiences, this feeling of mosque or amateur, there, there does feel like you need to die to be reborn you need to break to rebuild because if you stick you know un incessantly to that armature that was also invested by your ego then you're never going to get off you're you're going to wish you were over there but know that you pavlovingly if that's a word come back to it and, and you don't um you don't progress I love the idea of the group sessions and um, I, I've personally, my space that I'm trying to work in with non-medicine, uh, but requires time uh, is to do it through conversation and, and rehabilitate our ability to connect as Hari would say, just through being social again, uh, in a truer way than one behind masks where we can't talk. I have, Several more questions, but time is running short. I want to get to one thing, which is your relationship with your parents and the day, whenever it was May 20, when you came out and you told them about this. I don't know what, if whether it was May 20 or 2020 or before that, but you know, I'm imagining you had to come out on this. Uh, this was something of a, a different path than your parents might have been expecting. It's a great question. And still one that is challenging one for me to answer uh -huh. because, you know, as a parent and I am one, you always, or I always uh, look at my own children as a function of how well I was or how good I was as a parent. And of course, whatever their trauma or wounds are uh, may be as a result of me and may not be as a result of me. But when I uh, spoke to my parents, who are lovely people, about the fact that there's something that I believe the world needs to combat this horrible pandemic of mental illness, and I believe that it was psychedelics, 
and that this wasn't about treating symptoms the way medicine classically does. This was about getting into the inner depths of one's spirit to heal from within. That was a pretty esoteric subject for them. And I remember my, I, I booked, I actually scheduled two 90 minute sessions with my father. And I went back to the beginning of how psychedelics were used in the first wave with indigenous cultures and tribes uh, and shamans. And then how it went to the second wave with Harvard and Richard Alpert or Ram Das and Timothy Leary and Ralph Metzner doing their research and how unfortunately it went, these things got into the wrong hands. And that's why the stigma exists today. And that's why a lot of these medicines are still scheduled in the United States, the UK and Canada. And then I spoke about how ketamine as a legal, super safe alternative is available in the here and now. And that I, as somebody who had built a brand in the past, was uniquely situated and qualified to build a brand in partnership with a physician and an incredible business person to bring this to people in the here and now. Once those two 90-minute sessions with my father were complete, he was silent for about 10 seconds and he says, okay, I think what you're telling me is these medicines, and I'm glad he used the word medicines and not drugs, really open a doorway for people to heal. And that's when I knew this was, this was going to become a thing. If I could get my father, who's again, 83 years old, uh, grew up in, you know, during the drug war, um, could understand this, then I knew this was going to be a big, big, big thing. And not only a big thing in business, yeah, I'm sure it's going to be a big thing in business. Of course it is. But a big thing that is fundamentally going to change the fabric of our society. Because people are going to start to look within in lieu of looking outward to the solutions to their problems. Love it. My father's 84. So born just a, a year before in 1938, yours in 1939, I suppose. Um, I just, last question is around business. So it's tricky when you're trying to do good for society, help people and pharmaceutical companies nominally are doing the same thing, but you need money. You need to have investors. You need to go back to them and say the ROI, the EPS, the <laughs> profitability, which is all fine and good, except at some level, you know, you're, you're trying to allow people to heal. And, and presumably the, like doctors, the idea is you heal them and then they go off and they don't need you again. So they might do their six week treatment, then you, your, your loyalty, you know, the, the return subscribers kind of thing that Amazon might be talking about or Netflix for God's sake. Um, you don't have that, or at least that you can't, you're not promoting the fact that you're going to have return sub, you know, subscribers because it's be antithetical to the, proposition in the first place you build a place with 18 or, or however many pods you have beautiful environment um are you looking for investors do you need more how does that conversation go and, and what can i or anybody who's listening do to help well we are looking to expand so our ambition is to have 35 clinics like the one you visited in New York across the Northeastern United States within five years. And that is a big, audacious goal. Uh, and that does require capital and it does require us to think about business. But unlike, you know, classic medicine, we believe we can do well by doing good. And so we don't rush patients in and out of here. We want them to take their time because we want them to heal. And when they heal, they're going to tell their friends who are all suffering 
that this is the place to go. In terms of profitability, in terms of raising capital, these are functions and, and necessities that are required in any business, and this is no different. Um, we are raising capital at the moment. Um, we do see that our investor base is kind of a mix of people who are believe that psychedelics are the future of psychiatry. Uh, there's a number of them that believe that there needs to be a new solution in mental health. And there's a ton of impact investors that believe that you can be a profitable, valuable business and do good at the same time. It doesn't mean, you know, gouging a customer. You know, we believe we're offering a hell of a lot of value when we charge $4,500 for a seven treatment, six treatments plus a maintenance session protocol. And people say, wow, Jay, that's so expensive. And I say, yeah, it's, it's certainly an investment, but it's worth considering for a smoker how much they spend on cigarettes annually or somebody with alcohol use disorder, how much they spend on alcohol every year or somebody who can't get a, out of bed. What's that? What is that worth to them? What would they oh, pay? What about like getting a therapist for the next 10 years? Well, at $300 a week, I spent about 50 or $60,000 on therapy. And in retrospect, I could have been, could have spent 4,500 with a place like Nushama had it existed. So it is a investment, but I'm also a believer that the absolute greatest investment anybody can make is in themselves. Beautiful. Jay. Uh, welcome anybody to go check out newshama.com. Uh, and how could anyone follow what you're up to? Any any ways to connect with you? What, what's your preferred method, whether it's um, just follow what you do or connect into you? Yeah, I, I love when people reach out to me with ideas and, you know, out of the box concepts. So uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn, uh, through Instagram. Um, you know, or shoot me an email at j.godfrey at nushama.com. I'm, you know, open. I'm, I'm open. Beautiful. Well, uh, Nushama, uh, I love going visit it. I can uh, vouch for how beautiful the environment is down to the detail of the wallpaper. You've got an amazing book collection, uh, which just has every book everybody has to read. The books you've cited, I'll have in the show notes and I'll put your links in. Jay. Mercy Buckets. Thanks very much for being on. Thank you, sir. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue podcast. If you like the show and would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash Minter Dial. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And as ever, rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 and more blog posts on mintodile.com. Check out my documentary film and four books, including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man.
conditions and made a convinced man in the arms of a woman. Despite revenges and struggle, what to see? Live for the challenge so life's not incomplete. What's wrong with challenge? I know soon we all die. Like the feel of a stranger tucked around me, precipitating the danger to feel free. Trust in my reason and let me show you why. I'm a convinced man practicing my lines. I'm a convinced man here in these confines. A convinced man in the arms of a woman. I'm a convinced man. Put me to the test. I'm a convinced man. I'm ready for an arrest. I'm a convinced man in the arms of a woman. Kelly. Wild Precious Life is a podcast about dreaming big, digging in and connecting across distance, division, and loss. In each episode, I talk with prize-winning writers, musicians, and wanderers who remind all of us how we can make the most of the time we have. So meet me here. Let's walk and talk and dream and discover what it means to be wild, precious, and brave. 